Welcome into Inside Black and Gold and hurling closer and closer to the NFL draft that it is April. No April Fools here, though. Uh, back in action, Steve Geller along with Jeff Nowak. Hope you are doing well, Houdat Nation. How you been, Jeff? Well, if we're hurtling, if the draft is the sun and we are hurtling directly into it, that's kind of how I feel. Uh, <laughs> Starting to feel a little warm. It'll be over soon. We won't have anything to worry about after that. No, that's that's not how it goes. But I'm I'm doing good. I'm I, as you can tell if you're watching this, you can see the bags under my eyes. Maybe not be getting enough sleep, but uh, we'll figure that out. That's a that's a whole nother issue. But yes, it's our second pod of the week. We haven't had a two pod week in a while, so this is a this is a big moment. We're getting there. <laughs> um, we're gonna do another mock draft today, so. But, you know, this really hasn't been a ton that's changed. So we're kind of going to throw a curveball at you. So we're going to do two different types of mock drafts. Um, there's there's some construction going on behind me. So if you can hear that, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, good. So Steve's mock draft, he's going to trade up. So we're going to kind of do this. Like Steve's got a mock draft where he traded up, and we're going to talk about how that looks, what a trade up look could could be, right? Just an example of what what you might be looking at if you did trade up, who might be available, well, who you might target, that sort of thing. And so that's going to be his mock draft. We'll do that in a second segment. Mine is going to be the opposite where I do what the Saints never do and I trade down and I see, okay, what are some packages you could get, who you might target if you move down to the back end of the first, that sort of thing, what you might, can you add a third round pick, that sort of thing. So that's going to be the third segment. This first segment, we got a couple a couple things I want to talk about. There's a signing, a player that the Saints looked at, went on elsewhere, and then you talked to Sean Merriman on the on Sports Talk yesterday, and he had some interesting things to say on the new rule changes and also a big trade that happened in the NFL. But but first things first, the signing. The Saints signed Kalike Hudson. I do not know if I'm saying that name right. Linebacker, depth linebacker. He played for Michigan. He was the fifth round pick of the Commanders back in 2020. Now. You want to talk about teams that don't draft well and <laughs> not seem to be able to develop players. The commanders now have zero players remaining on their roster from their own 2020 draft class. Think about that. That's crazy. Cause we're not even four years in these guys get four year contracts. The, the, the one that's obviously the big shocker is chase young because the second overall pick in the draft, man, come on. And he's on the saints now. So the Saints have more members, and I think uh, <laughs> Matt Paris from NOLA.com was the first yeah. one to point this out. He would know because he covered the Commanders for several years. Uh, the Saints have two members of the Commanders 2020 draft class, and the Commanders have zero. Um, but yeah, so Kalike Hudson, he's a guy who's a special teamer. I think you look at this and you say, well, why would you bring him in? It's because a guy like Zach Bond is now out of town. So you're going to have kind of open tryouts, basically, for okay, who's going to step up on special teams? That was something that Zach Bond provided. It's one of the reasons his roster spot was always secure, even though people be like, what does Zach Bond even do? He plays special teams. That's what he did. That, that's why his spot was secure, even when he wasn't necessarily delivering in that off-ball role the way you probably hoped he would develop into. Now he's gone. So you got to find ways to, to fill that. That's why he brought in Stanley Morgan, right? Another guy who's basically a career special teamer. Now, Kalike did get more snaps in the regular defense toward the tail end of last season. He averaged about 50 snaps a game over the final month with the Commanders. This was a Commanders team that was headed nowhere. So don't take that as necessarily a, wow, he, they really love him because they didn't bring him back. Right. So, but it is kind of, you get more tape on the guy. Is, is, is that's what you're really looking at there. Is you get a four-game sample size to kind of see what he was able to do. And I think he had a decent showing in that. So if he makes the roster and you suddenly have a need for a depth linebacker, you can at least look at it and say, yeah, he has done it at the NFL level, which isn't something you can necessarily say about a lot of the other guys like DeMarco Jackson. He hasn't really ever gotten a good run as a playing defensive linebacker. He's a special teams guy. So I think that's kind of what you're looking at, but yeah, that's the, it's another depth signing for the saints today. Uh, interested to see, you know, him on the field. Obviously, when we get out there to to watch some practices, uh, that way down the road. But uh, Mike Dettelier posted one of his draft write ups uh, on him, and the fact that you know you're going through all the little nuggets of information and played some slot corner at Michigan. I thought it's interesting. No, he's another athletic guy. I think that's kind of right. what they're looking at at the linebacker position is, is, is athletic guys who can do several different things. And, you know, we, we talked about this a lot in the last episode. We don't have to go through it again, but the new kickoff rule, right? 
I think it's going to maybe adjust some of your prototypes for what you maybe look for in a special teams role. You know, I think you're going to need a lot more guys who can tackle in space than you than you really needed before because there was really no space to worry about on kickoffs. You didn't really have to even consider it. You were kicking it out of the back of the end zone. You're moving on. Now, I think that's a little different. Um, and it's and it's the coverage is going to be different than the coverage would have been in the punt game. So I do think that does create some question marks of, you know, maybe guys who have been making the roster as special teamers because they can do X, Y, Z. Now you need someone who can do A, B, C, right? And and so maybe you see a little bit of a shift from these these guys that you have uh, seen make the roster in the past. So I think that's interesting. It's going to be something that we see develop in camp. But I don't think that this is a you – know, like they brought in Willie Gay from the Chiefs, right? And I think you brought in Willie Gay with the idea that he could compete for a starting spot. He Absolutely. could push Pete Werner. And, you know, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that he's your week one starter if he shows up in camp and shows out in camp. I don't think that's the case with Kalike. I think he's he's really competing for a special teams role. Yeah, totally. And uh, obviously we know how important those positions are, though, too. So uh, uh, Darren Rizzi seems to be having quite the offseason. So we'll see how those special teams get beefed up in the uh, the offseason here and how they look going into things like you mentioned with the new kickoff rules in place is going to be a lot of fun to see. Yeah, and I don't think they're done. I think they're going to keep adding special teams options, and you're gonna it's going to be basically open tryouts. With I mean, not necessarily open tryouts because that would mean that anyone could show up, but basically, like you're going to have a lot of guys on the roster who have a chance to make the roster who maybe might not have had a realistic shot in the past because I, I think a lot of people are kind of starting at the same space now. One player who's not going to be in that group because we know this, is Avante Maddox. He came in to visit the Saints early on in the free agency process. I think slot corner is a position that they're going to have to look at and probably add a piece at. He re-signed with the Eagles um, this week. So he's no longer on their radar as a potential slot corner option. And I would guess, you know, I don't I don't know how his medicals checked out. He has dealt with injuries. Maybe that was a factor. But I think for the Saints, one of the issues you're running into is, and it's another thing we talked about in the last episode, you're kind of in a holding pattern for the slot corner position because right now it's you're starting a slot corner as Alante Taylor because if you don't trade Marshawn Lattimore, you're probably going to keep Alante Taylor in the slot. If you do trade Marshawn Lattimore, you're going to bump Alante Taylor outside and then you have to bring in a slot corner. And you're probably going to want to pay a little bit more in that scenario, but you don't want to just sign somebody with the and then not have a spot. So it, it becomes a little more complicated. And I think that's why you're not seeing them sign a guy right now, because you don't know what level of investment you necessarily have to make at slot corner. And there's going to be options. Maybe you get a guy in the draft. Maybe you wait it out and see a guy whose market didn't develop and, and you can bring him in on a sweetheart deal late in the, late in the game. But uh, no, it's not going to be Avante Maddox. We know that. Yeah. We know there's still talented guys out there. Uh, at least in the safety market and free agency. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so I do want to move on to to the Sean Merriman interview, which was interesting. And Sean Merriman's a unique guy. <laughs> um, you know, uh, he's getting into MMA now. I think is that is that what he's talking about? Yeah, he's got his lights out, uh, lights out um, mixed martial arts events that have been going on coming on to promote them for a while now with us got one coming on uh this saturday number 15 i believe uh it'll be on fubu tv every uh, encouraging everyone to check it out and I, i've never really gotten into mma stuff honestly if i'm just putting that out there <laughs> i mean we did both watch roadhouse i was maybe sean <laughs> should have tried to get in on that because that was a big mma uh, themed event there um <laughs> yeah he should have for sure yeah, so that's what he should have done. He should have gotten into gotten into Roadhouse the movie and worn like a lights out MMA shirt. That would have been a, anyway. No, but, that's, uh, that's brilliant marketing right there. You need to be uh, you you got in the wrong profession. Just saying, um, Sean, hit me up. But <laughs> okay, so but you no, know, a couple of things you talked about. You talked about um, the rule changes, which. You know, I was surprised almost to hear Sean say, I think the NFL got it right on um, both of these rule changes, which is the kickoff for the same reason we talked about, which is like it's going to bring guys into the game that have been kind of erased from the game. It's like Devin Hester, if if Devin Hester had come into the league in the last 10 years, he probably gets cut, right? 
he came, what, he came in the league when he came in the league and he's a Hall of Famer, right? Like that's 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 what's changed over the last decade in the NFL and the new kickoff rule will create a need for that again. And then that's exciting because guys like Devin Hester, Dwayne Harris, Cordero Patterson, they made the game more exciting. And now you're giving them an option to do that again. So he agreed with that. The other one he agreed with was the hip job tackle, which I was very surprised by, but I thought he made some really good points. So uh, this is what he had to say. You know, I, I feel sorry for defenders right now because um, it, it's almost with all these other rules, it's really hard to go out and play football. But in my opinion, the NFL got this one right in particular. And I know what everybody's going to say, oh, your lifestyle, what are you doing talking about? You can't tackle guys a certain way. Uh, I think in this, with this particular tackle, um, it, the, the injury rate, because a runner can't defend himself. He can't curl up. He can't stiff arm. You can't go. He, he doesn't even have the option to go down because he's pulled down with somebody's body weight on top of him. And if there wasn't so many other rules already, defenders and, and, and people wouldn't have a problem with this. It's the, it's the problem that there are so many other unnecessary rules in the NFL that just this seems like an added one. But I just re- really believe the NFL got this one right. And I agree. I think he makes a really good point there. I think one of the issues that you have as a defender is it's not just – that they're outlawing this one specific type of tackle, which if you don't understand what a hip drop tackle is, it's basically uh, in most cases you're fo- you're chasing a guy down and you grab him around the waist. And rather than kind of like slinging him down or pulling him down, you you're using your own body weight and you're dropping your hips to the ground from behind to take him down that way. And you're basically becoming an anchor. And the issue becomes the only way you can really do that when you're chasing a guy down is to land on their legs and you're basically rolling up on their legs. And it just, I mean, you, the obvious things happen. Things break when you put pressure on them. Mark Andrews got hurt that way. You've seen a lot of guys get hurt that way. Logan Wilson is like the the poster child for like why this type of tackle is not a, allowed anymore because you do it all the time. Um, and it was legal, so you couldn't get mad. But like I kind of look at it as, you know, the horse collar tackle was allowed for a long time. And then I think Roy Williams of the Cowboys was a guy who did it constantly. And would, it would, people get hurt because you kind of, it's not, not, not difficult to understand. You grab someone by the back of the pads and you pull them down and your legs get caught up underneath you and things pop. And it's a similar situation. One of the reasons that NFL players, just like any union, right? Any union exists and you're trying to make rules and the union's like, nah, we don't have to allow this. And we're going to do that. We're not going to allow this out of principle because we don't like the slope it creates. Whether it's a good idea or not, a union exists to protect the people within the union. And I think that's why you saw so much blowback was like, no, you've already given us so many bullshit rules that we have to adhere to on how to tackle a guy. You're just adding another one. You're not taking any of them away. You're not making it any easier for us to do it in another way. If I go high, it's a penalty. If I go low, it's a penalty. If I grab him by the pads, it's a penalty. If I grab him by the face mask, it's a penalty. If I grab him by the hips and fall to the ground, it's a fucking penalty. It's how do you play football? And so I understand that. But this one specifically, it's like you can see the injuries. And you can see how dig- significant they are and how they can basically happen anytime you do this. And so I, you know, I've, I, I, at first I was kind of on the, on the fence about it in terms of like, how are they going to officiate it? And I still have concerns about, okay, when they screw this up and they call something a hip drop tackle that wasn't a hip drop tackle because they just saw it in real time and it changes a game. Like, yeah, we're going to be talking about that the same way we talked about putting your body weight on a quarterback and, you know, all these other things going low, like the Tom Brady rule. Right. But at the end of the day, games are much better when the star players are intact at the end of them. Right. Uh, Look at the, look at the NFC championship game uh, two years ago when the, the 49ers finished it with, with no quarterback, or at least the quarterback who couldn't throw because guys got hurt. And it's like, that's not a good example because they didn't get hurt with through any illegal methods. But it's the fact of the matter is like, you don't want to play the second half of the season without Mark Andrews because he's getting tackled in a way that he didn't have to be tackled in. So I think yeah, it, I, just the fact that Sean Merriman, of all people, who's a former defensive player, is saying that, I think that kind of tells you a lot. Because once you get out of the league and you don't have to tackle anybody anymore, and this no longer becomes a, you know, uh, an issue of like I if I don't make that tackle I, I don't I get fired <laughs> you know uh, I think he kind of take when you take a step back and you just look at it and you look at the impact of it that's that's pretty telling 
that was totally it for me. Like initially you hear about the hip drop tackle being banned in the NFL and I threw my arms up. Oh, this league is going to shit. You know, we might as well put the flags on them. And then when you start really looking into it, watching the videos more on exactly the, the what is happening during the hip drop tackle, you're like, well, I, I kind of understand that the player safety aspect here. And it definitely swayed me more. And I, I, although I was surprised to hear Merriman uh, being in favor for it, I didn't think that was going to happen at all either. Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. Um, and this guy's in MMA. There's no rules in MMA. <laughs> like he could do anything in MMA. Right. right. But, uh, you know, I, I do think so. It's like, I get it. The, but my bigger issue is like, okay, how are you going to officiate this? <clears throat> This is going to be a very difficult thing to interpret in real time. Like, did he really do a hip drop tackle or did he just, how do you tackle a guy from behind now? Like, what's the actual way that you do that? Because NFL teams don't spend a ton of time practicing tackling throughout a season. They just don't. That's something you're expected to show up with. So it's actually going to be more college level where you have to drill this into guys that you're not allowed to do this. But you know where the hip drop tackle is still legal? Hmm college College? (laughs) yeah so what incentive do college programs have to teach young players not to tackle this way when it's technically not illegal it'd be like going to college and being like well you only have to get one foot in but we're gonna work exclusively on how to catch a ball and get both feet in no if if you if you in college if you want to catch a ball and you could have got one foot in but you ended up out of bounds because you were trying to get both feet in you're going to get reamed out on the sideline by your coach, right? So that's going to be the same thing here. It's like if, if that's the easiest way to get a guy down, you're going to do it in college. Then you get to get, to get to get to the NFL, and suddenly that's against the rules. And so incoming rookies aren't going to have that skill set. Veteran players aren't going to have that skill set. And so how are you going to do that this season? And and then how are the officials going to going to perceive it? What will will every single officiating crew have a different interpretation of what a hip drop tackle is? <sighs> Yeah, it's going to be tough. But I do I do agree with the the idea that like yeah, you need to find a way and it's going to be ugly in at points. We're going to have mistakes, you're going to have bad calls, you're going to have things that you probably weren't anticipating. But it is what it is. Yeah, it's one of those that y- you know, obviously, especially year 1's going to be rocky with the outcomes of things. Hopefully it doesn't affect the Saints too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've already, I mean, all we talk about it basically every week, like, oh, the official screwed this one up. The official screwed this one up. Yeah. You know, uh, and it's like, oh, that was a hip drop tackle, but they didn't call it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. Um, like, the, it, it, I, I think the best comparison you can make in terms of it's going to affect the games at really annoying points and annoying ways is like the body weight tackles on the quarterback because the, right. that was just a vague thing. And you understand what they're trying to get rid of, which is essentially the Kentavia Street hit on Drew Brees. Like that's what they were trying to get out of the game. Right. Stuff that's going to break ribs and literally end careers if you do it, you know, in a certain way. And for a long time, that was encouraged. <laughs> like, yeah, take down the quarterback, make him feel it. And then you got to the point where it's like, no, as a defensive player, you have to be aware in that moment that you have to avoid that level of contact. And I think Clay Matthews was a guy who got hit with it all the time. It's just the way he tackled. And I get, I bet you Logan Wilson will too. <laughs> He's going to have a hard time working that out of his game. But, you know, I think in like three, four years, we're going to be talking about this the same way we talk about the horse collar tackle, which is like it, you, every time you see it, you'll be like, what an idiot. Like he should have known not to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but if, if you're in the NFC championship game this season and you know, there's a, there's like a huge third down play and you make the tackle and then be like, Nope, hip drop 15 yard penalty. <laughs> not gonna be no, good like you said it's gonna be like oh you gotta be kidding me yeah <laughs> but all right that's that's it you know the other thing that we could talk about was Stefan Diggs getting traded to the bill getting traded from the bills to the Texans I don't really think we need to talk about it a ton but you know we, you you texted me and you're like man the Texans are loaded and I kind of look at it like is is he really an upgrade to what they had is because I feel like the bills even being willing to trade him is a pretty good indicator that they think he's cooked um, I they're, just they're think like $30 million in dead cap. Yeah, right. That, that's, that's a very telling sign right there. But I just feel like obviously that things didn't mesh well with how he was visibly upset with the team and, you know, 
with the quarterback. Things didn't things didn't work out over there. And I don't know really know if Diggs went on social media blasting Josh Allen at all, but I know he made some comments out there saying, you know, basically how important he is to the team. And they were like, all right, well, we'll we're we're gonna get rid of you. And it's just gonna be an interesting kind of I don't want to, I guess, a, a rebuild over there for their wide receiving core. Um, you don't have Gabe Davis, Gabe Davis anymore. You don't have uh, Stefan Diggs. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Who's who's he got over there now? I have a feeling they're going to be drafting a wide receiver. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but we'll see. But yeah, I mean, the, it doesn't make the Texans worse. Let's put it that way. No, um, for sure. I, I, I think that, you know, CJ Stroud obviously has a nice little uh, group around him. And man, oh man, if he keeps developing into year two the way, you know, we saw him in that short amount of time in year one getting acclimated to the NFL. Yeah, man, Texans are going to be for real. Yeah, I really like that core, too. I mean, like I'm kind of saying, oh, Stefan Diggs might be cooked, but you're talking about Stefan Diggs, Nico Collins, who I think is like a legit wide receiver one that nobody talks about. And then Tank Dell, who um, I was obsessed with coming out and he showed why last year so yeah you had yeah, him that, on the saints mock draft right or no i did uh, yeah. everyone <laughs> uh but he went to houston he went to houston and then he got drafted by houston so that was gonna, right. always going to be a tough <laughs> uh, a tough team for them to get past um i i would have been curious if he did get to the saints in the third round if they would have gone with him they went to kendra miller um but yeah so let's let's wrap that up we'll come back and we'll go into steve's mock draft steve had the 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 assignment trade up and, uh, and see what we can get. And that's probably the more, the more likely uh, outcome if there is a trade happening for the Saints because, as we all know, Mickey Loomis has never traded back in, in his life, and I don't expect to see him start doing that in his 60s. Um, but we'll but, find out. But to me, man, I, like I said the, uh, before, the, getting more assets, obviously, for the third or fourth round would be immense. Now, you could do that maybe with some of your fifth rounders to get into the fourth, but... If you could work out a way to somehow get that third round pick that you mentioned, I think that's ideal. Obviously, with the uh, with the team needing so many uh, holes to fill, I would say this off season. I agree, but we're going to talk about all that <laughs> after these ads. Stick around. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. It's mock draft time, baby. This is kind of 3.0, but with an asterisk. Because, like, I don't know about you, but I drafted three guys that I would not have drafted if I did not trade, if that makes sense. Like, I drafted three guys that I don't think the Saints are going to draft, but that's who I drafted here because it kind of got all wonky. And I have a feeling you did the same thing. Well, but- I got lucky with the at least my first round pick. I knew once I was given the assignment of trading up, I was like, I know what I'm trading up to get. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. <laughs> and you did the more sensible thing. Um, <laughs> let's let's get into it. Uh, we don't have to wait nearly as long as we did previously for uh, for this because. Um, hold on, let me. The PFF that. simulator buying into the uh, J.J. McCarthy hype there. So as, as you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, first three picks are quarterbacks. The Patriots got sold a lemon. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. The Patriots just in this draft. Like, again, the J.J. McCarthy hype makes no sense to me. It seems like every year someone that's like, oh, he had, didn't do it in college, but he's got all the intangibles. We got it. And that's what's happening. So Caleb Williams goes number one. Jane Daniels goes number two to the Commanders. J.J. McCarthy goes number three to the Patriots. Pats are hoping he's uh, the Michigan man is like the other guy that, you know, retired. Yeah, maybe they think Michigan is the like that's what that's what was wrong. They went with Alabama instead of Michigan. There you and, go. Uh, that was their mistake with Mac Jones. Not not the not the evaluation. It was the it was the college. You know what? I'm still interested to see what Mac can do in the NFL. Uh, I don't think he's completely a wash. Yeah, we'll see. He's backing up Trevor Lawrence now. So right. <laughs> uh, we'll find out. He got traded to the Jaguars. But okay, let's let's go through. So not a ton of surprises here. Number four, Dallas Turner. I mean, the big surprise is that instead of Marvin Harrison, it's it's Malik Neighbors, the first right. wide receiver off the board. And I, you know, and a lot of people might disagree with that. I think Malik Neighbors is the best wide receiver in this draft. Personally, that said, I've watched him a lot more than the other guys, so that probably you know sways my opinion. But here, he would be the number, the first wide receiver off the board, uh, going to the Chargers at number five. Number six is a big surprise to me. 
Well, I mean, it's a surprise in the sense that he got there, right? Like, it's not a surprise in the sense that the Giants who need a quarterback are drafting a quarterback at number six. No, the to surprise me, I, is thought, that, I thought they'd go wide receiver, honestly, there. Well, it depends. I mean, it, it depends how you feel about Daniel Jones. This would be an indicator that they're like, nah, <laughs> we're good. Right. They go with another ACC guy, uh, North Carolina and Drake May. Um, and I think that's going to be a wild card is – you know, do you are you really committed to Daniel Jones? And if you are, are you going to go get him the wide receiver that he so desperately needs? Um, but, you know, these next few picks are helpful in terms of what you did. And we'll get to that yeah. in a second. But so the Titans took Marvin Harrison Jr. at number seven. Who the I was Falcons, scared going to take my target. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Falcons go with Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo, a guy that I really like. Um but then, you know, why don't we explain your trade? What what was the trade you made? Uh, and we can then go with your pick. Uh, ended up, you know, seeing how the, the board ended up shaking out there. Uh, I was worried about Joe Alt going to the Titans right off the bat. And I, I just didn't know if I was going to be able to finagle a trade to move up. And honestly, I had the, the mock draft simulator going way too fast and kind of missed <laughs> it or I probably would have tried to get up sooner. But once I saw that all was still available, I was like, all right, I, I got to make my move. Uh, and uh, doing the, the trade with the simulator uh, was pretty interesting. I offered them a the first round pick from the 14th overall, the fifth round selection, which was 175th overall, and also a third rounder from next year. Obviously, the Saints don't have a third round selection. Uh, this year and the probability of the trade getting accepted uh, was pretty good 77 percent and thankfully the Chicago Bears in this simulation took that so I'm on the clock then with pick number nine and I, I knew exactly like I said when I was given this assignment what I was going after sorry that's bad right. timing yeah if I was gonna say anything about this trade it's that I think the Bears kind of got hosed a little bit yeah um, Mickey, call me yeah, no, if, if this was a trade that was actually on the board and you were able to make it, then this is a winning trade. Now, I would be surprised if the Bears were able to take that, were willing to take that little to move back five spots. But I do think that, you know, if this was a team that only had the number nine pick, you would be like, there's no way they make this trade. That said, when you have a second pick in the top 10, it does feel like at times you can get away with a little less because you're not worried about well, we already have we don't have another first rounder, uh, kind of like the Giants, for example, when the when the Bears traded up to for to get Justin Fields, I think the Giants traded down to like 21, but that was their only bite at the apple that season. They took Kadarius Tony, and he was a he was a shit show from day one, and so you ended up look back, you look at back at that draft, and you're like, man, that's brutal. Like what a that what a terrible miss. Whereas. Even if the Bears did this, traded back to 14 and took someone that ended up being a, just a, a waste, you would still have Caleb Williams to look back at this draft at. And you're picking up a future asset and a future third rounder. I would say you probably that 175 would probably have to be, you know, a higher pick. You know, I, like I don't think you I think you you'd have a hard time getting away with just the 175 or next year you'd have to give up that second rounder probably. Would be, but either way, we don't need to talk more about that. That's kind of where that, that that's how that's what we're doing here, right? We're trying to figure out what is a reasonable trade if you were trying to go up from fourteen to nine, and you're still you got to give up a lot, right? Like that's why it, what makes it so difficult, and that's why it's like when you have a lot of pressure when that when that trade up ends up being Marcus Davenport, <laughs> it looks real bad because you gave up extra assets to get that guy. Um, in this case, you were able to get the best offensive tackle on the board a guy who is definitely not getting to 14. So I, I think that's that would be, if you're trading up, this is the type of trade-up that I would want, is I am getting the number one guy at that position, and that's what you have. Right, that was definitely, like I said, one of the assignment was given, it was like, all right, I got to trade up. I need the best tackle out there. Let me go get it. Uh, was kind of worried about the Titans getting in there to take them, and then obviously feeling pretty validated afterwards making the trade and then seeing the Jets – uh, go tackle right away too. I agree. Yeah, and Talia Sefuanga is the guy that you know. It's funny. He's always off the board in your mocks, and he's always on the board in my mocks at fourteen. I don't know what it is, uh, but yeah, he goes to the to the Jets, and then that guy 
that I was always kind of surprised to see his stock be as high as it was. Goes off the board right after the Vikings. They get Roma Dunze, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it kind of just uh, the Vikings need to kind of restock the shelves there. Um, and uh, yeah. and that's interesting to me. Well, we can kind of go through the rest of the first round. We won't spend a ton of time on them because, you know, you don't you don't have another pick on your your mock until 45. So we got to get to that. But Terry and Arnold to the Broncos, cornerback at Alabama at number 12. I wasn't crazy Brock- about that one for Denver. No, it's an interesting one, but I, you know, they they do have uh, oh, what's his name, the uh, Pat Sertain, who you know is probably a top five corner in the NFL. So you you're really just doubling down at that position at a very important position. Brock Bowers gets all the way to 13. So if you were a guy who was like, I'm going to sit at 14, and I want Brock, he didn't get there. the 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 Raiders took him off the board at 13, tight end out of Georgia. The Bears traded back and ended up with Jared Verse Not bad. out of Florida State, right? So he's, a, I think he was your pick in your first mock draft. Right. So, so it's, it's he like, ends up at 14. Yeah. And with the Ryan Ramchek news, it's like if it, that, that could sway the Saints, right? If they were like really on the fence about, hey, we can get this elite playmaker at 14 or, or we can get a tackle. But no, we have Ramchek. We feel okay. You know, maybe we, we, we feel like we can develop Penning and maybe draft a guy behind him or whatever. And you and you're like, yeah, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get a little crazy here at 14. That Ram check news probably does, you know, probably pull you in one direction. Um, so if you weren't willing to make this trade prior, maybe you, now you are. Is is my point? Because uh, you you know there are other options, right? J.C. Latham at 15, right. Olu Fashanu at 16, another guy that's very popular with the Saints. Yeah, you're starting to see this run, obviously, on offensive tackles, and yeah, that's been one of the biggest buzzes. I think going into this draft and what one reason too, like you feel pretty good about the saints, at least being able to fill that offensive tackle slot because of the class this year and what, and what is out there. Um, but like I said, the goal being for me, get that number one guy at the position on the board. And uh, hopefully it ends up working out where we've seen. Yeah. We've, we've talked about it just with a guy like Davenport or whoever you, you've traded up in it, it hasn't really worked out for. So um, there's there's no obvious guarantees. And I know there's going to be mixed emotions from Saints fans about picking a Notre Dame guy. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, Golden Domer. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it's like, OK, you're, you're, if your goal is to get a day one plug and play starter, this is your move. Because that's what Joe Walt is. He's a guy who you can feel comfortable slotting him in as a starter week one. And, you know, he's going to be a rookie. He's going to ha- take his lumps like any rookie would. But you're not like sitting there like, wow, what's going to happen? Whereas some of these other guys, I think they probably would be best suited backing up somebody to start and maybe taking over that job after a few games. Um, so if you're going to wait around and, and take like a Tyler guy in or somebody like that. Um, and that's maybe what you would have to do if you traded down, um, foreshadowing, but you know, that's where you are. So anyway, you're, you're getting a run on some skills here. You're getting Nate Wiggins out of the, out of Clemson to the Jags at 17, Brian Thomas, LSU guy, 18, Bo Nix to the Rams at 19. That's an interesting one, but it would make sense. I mean, Stafford, like you'd be like, yeah, the Rams have Matt Stafford, but he's an older guy. So this is a, this would be a good, such a very good situation for Bo Nix to land in, in my opinion. Yeah, who did who did the Rams sign as a backup though? Well, they had they had uh, the kid when? from Georgia um, last year. Oh, I can't recall. Oh, right. They um, but they also that's had Wentz. That's in Bennett. Right. I'm not sure. Who Jimmy they, Garoppolo. That's who they ended. I was like, they got somebody. Yeah, but again, like if your your goal is to get a young guy in there to develop him over a sure. year or two, and then when Stafford is ready to hang it up, you got a guy. I think that's a that'll be a smart pick. Um, and then you kind of go Graham Barton tackle uh, to the Steelers, late to Latu to the Dolphins, Cooper DeJean pretty late in this muck uh, to the to the Eagles cornerback yeah. out of Iowa. Um, Byron Murphy the second, he's a guy who you took in a previous mock goes to the yeah. Vikings. Tyler Guyton offensive tackle out of Oklahoma goes to the Cowboys. DeJean Newton to the Packers. Troy Fatani another tackle goes to the Bucks. Tackle, Marius tackle, Mims tackle baby, they keep yeah. going. Right, <laughs> Marius Mims tackle goes to the Cardinals. These are guys who. You know, if you trade it down, they would be in your range. Wide receiver Adonai Mitchell to the Bills. Chop Robinson to the Lions. Jackson Powers Johnson, center out of Oregon. A lot of people like him. He goes to the Ravens. Cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry to the 49ers. In the last pick of the first round, a guy I really like that if he's there at 45, I want him every time. Darius Robinson goes to the Chiefs. Edge rusher out of Missouri. That's funny you said that because I was actually trying to, like, should I try and finagle 
moving up in the second to get a guy like him. He was definitely on my radar. A second trade. Yeah, I was trying to be fancy. I considered a second trade down in mind, <laughs> but I was like, yeah, we didn't discuss that. I don't want to go weird. Um, all right, so you got Panthers take TJ Tampa in the first pick of the second round. White, cornerback out of Iowa State. Troy Franklin, speedy wide receiver out of Oregon, goes to the Patriots. Another fast guy, Xavier Worthy, the fastest guy, I should say, out of Texas, goes to the Cardinals at 35. Jordan Morgan, tackle, goes to the Commanders. Xavier Leggett, the guy I took in a previous mock, goes like to the too. Chargers. Roger Rosengarten, another tackle out of Washington, goes to the Titans. So we have, what, 10 tackles off the board? Pretty I mean, wild. It's a deep tackle draft. By not, I pick 38. Uh, Kamari Lasseter, 39 to the Panthers, cornerback out of Georgia. Max Melton, cornerback out of Rutgers, goes to the Commanders at 40. He'll probably be on the Saints in like 2028. Um, Tyler Newbin, safety. You didn't think that joke was funny. I thought that joke was funny. <laughs> uh, Tyler Newbin, safety, goes to the Packers. Lad McConkey, wide receiver out of Georgia, goes to the Texans. Peyton Wilson, linebacker, North Carolina State, goes to the Cardinals. Michael Penix Jr., the guy you took at 45 in the last mock. And I it's was like getting ready knew. to do it again. It's like they knew. Yep. He goes to the Raiders at number 44. Quarterback out of Damn Wisconsin. Damn you, silver and black. Damn you, silver and black. And so, dun, 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 Saints on the board. Who's the pick? And with the, with the 45th selection in the NFL draft, the New Orleans Saints select Braden Fisk from Florida State, defensive lineman. And why is yeah. that? Um, making a move, I know a lot of folks are critical of uh, him because he's a little bit older than most prospects, uh, but I'm still trying to beef up my O-line, which at least I did in the first round. I want to still address the defensive line, and I think he's a guy that could definitely add some more pass rush uh, for that D-line. Uh, I know that you know he's got a great athleticism, good quickness, a burst. Uh, curious about more how he'll do in the stuff in the run game uh, in the NFL. But I think he's got that high motor kind of ability and uh, someone uh, that I know is uh, one of those max effort kind of guys I think can bring to this defensive front and another worthy addition to a line that definitely needs help going into this year. Uh, I'd like to curious to see how he'd be along with Brian Brzee. No, I, I I agree with with your with your assessment here. He's very athletic, right? He's got these. He fits the measurables. He fits the profile that they'd want at defensive tackle. Um, and I, you know, and the Saints have shown that they don't mind drafting on a strength. And and that's you know, I don't know if you call it a strength per se, but right. drafting on a position where they already have starters in in line. Like there's no direct path to a starting spot at defensive tackle because you still have Colin Saunders, Nathan Shepard, and obviously Brian Brzee. But you did lose Malcolm Roach, right? So there is some room in that rotation for another guy. And I like the idea of having, you know, it's like you you don't ever think about the defensive tackle position. But when you have blue chip guys at those at both those spots, as a, especially as a 4-3 defense, man, that makes a difference. When you can stop the run as a 4-3 defense, your life gets so much easier. And so... I like this idea of having these two just big dudes, these athletic freaks at the defensive tackle spot, just making life miserable on quarterbacks and, and running backs. So uh, I, I I like it. And you know that you, you could have gone more need based here. Mike Sandra still is a guy who I took in the first mock draft. PFF has come around because when I took him, he gave me an F. Now he's apparently <laughs> at 45 is the right pick. You know, they probably would have given you an A. So don't <laughs> again, don't know his PFF grades because they're usually right. bullshit, but. Yeah, it's definitely not a knee-based pick, but I do like the pick. Yeah, I'm just hoping, uh, you know, he can develop uh, after, you know, do, making the pick, doing a little more reading on him. I've seen there's been some criticism about his his hand usage, so going to need some coaching up in the pros. Yeah, I mean, when you, you, you get a guy at 45, that's the biggest difference between getting a guy at 14 and getting a guy at 45 or even like 24, right? Late first round or where you got Brian Brzee in the 20s, right? The biggest difference is, they're not going to be as pro ready as some of these other guys. You are going to have to develop them. You know, like that's why that's why you can get a a, a guy in the second round that you know, maybe has first round traits but is not going there cuz he needs some work. Um but I do think the Saints have uh you know, they've done a pretty good job at developing interior line guys. Um, I don't know what you're talking about with the PFF grading system because my first pick got an A+ plus and then this pick got me an A, so I'm very happy with them. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a red flag, I think. <laughs> right. No, I get it. <laughs> yeah. 
But no, I, I I would love this draft. I think, you know, you partially because you were able to steal the ninth pick from the Bears with for basically nothing. Um, and if you're able to do that, great. You know, like a lot of times that will happen. Is is these the Bears are like, yeah, you know what, we don't really love anybody at this spot, or we love six different guys at this spot, and we can't really make a we can't you know, make a decision anyway. So we'll move back and then let the board decide for us. You know, I think that happens. And I think like you mentioned there, I did think about, I was like, well, the bears had the first overall pick. Maybe they'd be willing to, you know, go with this, uh, go through with this a little more. And the fact that, you know, I just think that the, the saints uh, giving up next year's second, uh, third round pick to me, I figured they, they thought was closer to being a second rounder since I don't think a lot of folks, uh, especially with the Vegas win totals coming out at seven and a half for th- this coming season, I have a lot of high hopes around the black and gold heading into you know twenty twenty four. First of all, that win total is like take the. Oh, I know, I know. Like, come on! But, but they did have <laughs> nine and a half last year. Well, right, but why? Why is this year different? What's changed? Um, <laughs> that's I the part that doesn't make sense to me. Kirk Cousins like, is in the division now. Yeah, like everyone's <laughs> a fuck. Everyone's in love with the Falcons and Kirk Cousins. I don't get it. I really don't. But I think they have the Falcons at ten and a half. Yeah, which is crazy. I know. I was that's like, what? Crazy. Give me the under. But yeah. Well, I mean, like they could have a great season and get nine wins. Right. Like it's that's just the, that swing makes no sense to me. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe I'm misreading the situation. And this 36 year old is is the next coming of Peyton Manning. I don't know. Um, like this is not like they're treating it like it's Peyton Manning to the Broncos. That's how that's how the the consensus seems to be treating Kirk Cousins to Atlanta. It's like when Peyton Manning signed with the Broncos and went nuts. Championship. <laughs> well, they actually didn't win championship that year. They that was the year they lost to the. Uh, Seahawks. They got blown out by the Seahawks. They made the Super Bowl. They got blown out by the Seahawks. Oh, but that was man. Peyton Manning's massive year with the Broncos. The next year, he kind of had a crappy season. He ended up getting hurt. Uh, Brock Osweiler started right. a bunch of games. And then he kind of rode the bus to the Super yes. Bowl and they beat the Panthers. Um, but like that's that's how people are treating, it seems, this this move is is Peyton Manning to the Broncos. Because they that was about the same age. Uh and I, I, I have a hard time with that. I really What's do. funny is I, we, you've been on record before calling Kirk Cousins Mr. You know, average or Mr. League average, He's right? Mr. League. Well, like, I, if, if, like Falcons fans will say I'm, I'm saying that as an insult. I'm saying yeah. that as an accurate statement of like league average quarterbacks win games. No one's right. Games. It's definitely not a, an insult. I don't feel at all to him. But yeah, he just, That's you know, what he kind is. Of guy. he's a league average quarterback. Right. And, and, you know, you could say Derek Carr is a below league average quarterback. I don't know. But either way, getting to league average at the quarterback position, a lot of teams would take that. Oh, it's, it's a huge upgrade for Atlanta. I'm not going to give them that at all, but I don't think it stratus, you know, rockets them into double digit wins. <laughs> if the Falcons had a league average quarterback last year, they'd probably win nine games. I'm not going to disagree. Yeah. Um, that's probably the difference between seven and 10 and nine and eight is a league average quarterback. But, Okay. Let's wrap up this mock. We're going to go into the trade down mock, the mock that's definitely going to be wrong because the Saints never do it. And uh, we will get into that. This is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Steve Geller. Stick around. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. One more segment, one more mock draft. Let me close yours out so I don't... Put the wrong one up on the board. Um, and so I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. So remember, my task was to trade down, was to find a trade down option. And it's it's tough because, you know, what the, the PFF mock draft tool is, is really good for a lot of things. <laughs> but one thing it doesn't do is give you like preemptive trade options. So... When you got if when I would get to 14, they would give me trade options. But at that point, yeah. it was a little late in the game to kind of have figured out where I wanted to go. So I ended up making the trade prior to the draft simulations starting. Oh wow. Um, okay. And it's funny because the trade I was able to get was accepted, right? It, like I I set up this trade and it was a hundred percent exception. It was a hundred percent that it was going to be accepted. But it was the second one that I had done. And the first one, I got the 14 and no one wanted to make a trade with me. I don't know why, <laughs> but like I tried to make a similar trade and it would not happen. 
And uh, the team I tried to trade with was the Cowboys. The Cowboys pick at number 24. Okay. And so I was like, okay. Because my, my goal was, you know, just kind of generally, I want to trade back in the first round, pick up a third round pick, and then add a future asset, right? Like that was my goal. I didn't want to give up 45. So, I, cause I wanted to make three picks. I wanted to pick in the first, second and third round. And they were a team that, that made sense. So the trade I made is I gave up number 14 and my 2025 fourth rounder. What I got back was number 24 in the first round, obviously number 87, which is a mid tier third round pick. And then the Cowboys 2025 second rounder. So Ooh, sexy. I, I traded back 10 spots. I picked up a third rounder and then I turned next year's fourth into a second. And I feel good about that. Like you give up, that's a pretty long way to go back in the first round that you're going a full tier down, right? It, like you're at 14, you're getting, you know, tier like for a first round prospect, but a second tier first round prospect. Sure. At 24, you're getting a third tier first round prospect. So you have to get back enough that it justifies moving down. And it's tough. Like as I was going through this, I was like, man, I don't like this. I don't, I don't think this is what is going to happen for the saints. But <laughs> that's not what the, the assignment was the assignment. Anyway. So <laughs> let's go through uh, the picks. So this one's more traditional. Caleb Williams, number one, Jaden Daniels, number two to the commanders, Drake may number three to the Patriots, number four, Marvin Harrison, number five, Roman Dunze. So, that's your 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 mock was a little all over the place in terms of the the traditional order. This one was more on par, right. and that and that continues. Like the Giants go with JJ McCarthy at number six again. I would hate that as someone. I was going to say G men fans go Giants. nuts after that. I hate it. I complained about it. This is this was the same pick in the last mock that we did, and I went off on it then. So we don't need to do that again. <laughs> but you, if you want to hear my rant about why I would hate this pick, go back to that um, seven. Malik Neighbors to the Titans. And then this is interesting to me because you were able to trade up to number nine and get Joe Walt. In yeah. this mock, he goes at number eight to the Falcons. So that's really the part where it's like, man, those trades are tough because <laughs> e even if you were able to get the Bears to play ball with you and trade back, you wouldn't be able to get, if, if all Joe Walt was your target, you wouldn't be able right. to get him. So that's what those trade ups can be difficult. You have to wait. And so if I'm the Saints and I'm trying to trade up to number nine, I have to wait until number nine to make that trade because I'm not, if I make that trade early and then the guy I want goes off at eight, what the hell am I doing then? Exactly. So and then you give up those assets and you end up getting, you know, you get you could get Olu Fashanu. He's the guy who goes off the board at number nine. But what if he wasn't the target in the first place? I don't know. Um, but either way, so the, the tackles go off, you know, the run on tackle starts. You got the Jets at number 10, Has begun, Jason right? Latham, a couple edge rushers, Dallas Turner goes to the Vikings at 11, Jared verse to the Broncos at 12. And in this one, I would not have been able to sit at number 14 and get, uh, Taliesa Fuanga, who is the guy that I probably would have picked. Uh, he goes to the Raiders at 13, the Cowboys traded up. And one of the reasons I picked the Cowboys was because I know one of their needs is corner. And at 14, you're going to be able to pick the top corner on the board. You can look and you can see no corners have come off yet. So that's a trade that makes sense to me. If the Cowboys really want a, the top end corner, the guy they they have identified that like he is a star. Uh, you could put him across from the other digs and, and uh, Travion Diggs, I think his name is right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and suddenly you have a really impressive tandem of cornerbacks uh, in a league where you need that. So, I think that trade could end up being, you know, if the Saints did opt to trade back, I think 24 is a good target for them. That's why I picked them in the first place. But Brian Thomas Jr. to the Colts at 15. Quinion Mitchell to the Seahawks at 16. Brock Bowers drops all wow. the way to 17 yeah. in the clock. Goes to the, goes to the, the Jaguars. Uh, 18, Bengals, Graham Barton. 19, Troy Fatanu <laughs> to the Rams. So you're seeing a lot of these tackles go off the board. And, and a lot of back-to-back -back tackle picks. If I'm the Saints, and like I really want to come out of this with a tackle. This is a problem <laughs> for me because I traded back, and now I'm just waiting. Uh, and it's like you may have a guy that's still on the board that you really like, but you're sitting there sweating it out. That's what makes it really difficult when you trade back like this. Uh, Byron Murphy the second goes to the Steelers. Marius Mims another tackle to the Dolphins at 21. Latu Latu another guy that a lot of people like for the Saints goes yeah. off. 22. So that's like, again, you're sitting there. You're like, I like that guy gone. I like that guy gone. I like that guy gone. Um, Nate Wiggins is the last pick before the Saints. He goes off at number 23 to the Vikings. And so 
me still wanting a tackle. Ding, 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 ding. I go Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma. I like this. I like this pick, but he's probably my eighth rated tackle. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if Tyler Guyton was a guy you really liked and you were able to get him here, great. I like Tyler Guyton, but again, it's like the difference here is at 14, you could probably get a guy who you'd be comfortable playing week one or early in his rookie season. With Tyler Guyton, I don't think you want that. I think Tyler Guyton would be a guy that you have sit behind Ryan Ramchek and develop, and maybe that is the goal, and maybe that's what you're able to do. But what if Ramchek can't go at all? And suddenly you're you're looking at Trevor Penning and Tyler Guyton as your starting tackles. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> that, that's pretty scary. It is, Obviously. and that's why you know I you, you look at Mickey. I'm like, why doesn't he ever trade back? Because like this is the scenario you end up with, yeah. and it, you're like, man, I could have got someone at 14 that I feel way better about. Uh, right, we've, and we've it's heard gonna, them talk about they get that target that they want and they're aggressive and they go after it. Well, they view it as saying like, are we going to take the guy we want or are we going to take a lesser player? Right, exactly. Right, and that's and when you view it like that, it's like, yeah, that is tough. And again, we talked about the Giants trading back. To and taking Kadarius Tony and look how that turned out, right? So it's like you're not these late first round picks are tough, and uh, that's what you'd end up with. Um, but we do get three picks to make, so that's that kind of helps you. Chop Robinson to the Packers at 25, Jackson Powers Johnson to the Bucks at 26, Darius Robinson to the Cardinals at 27, Xavier Worthy, Cooper DeJean, Lad the McConkey. Wor- Worthy move makes sense after the Diggs trade for sure. Yes, yes. He goes to the Bills at 28. Ladd McConkey to the Ravens at 30. Adonai Mitchell. And then the final pick of the first round, Jerzon Newton, defensive tackle out of Illinois. So, I, again, I don't like this mock. This is, like, technically my mock, but I hate it. And that's how sometimes these happen, right? You end up yeah. with, I think, you'll you'll even you talk to the GMs at the end of a draft and be like, man, we really got hosed. Why did we <laughs> do this? You know, and they probably wouldn't admit that to other people, but they're probably looking at themselves in the mirror being like, I did not handle this very well. <laughs> and I think that's what I would be saying to myself after this first round. Is there a pick at 24 tackle wise that you were hoping would still be around? Yeah. I mean, Tyler Guyton is actually the guy I liked. Marius Mims is beyond there too. But the fact of the matter is I barely got onto that tier. Like, <laughs> like this was the last tackle on that. And you talked about a third yeah. tier first round tackle. This is the last guy. There's no other guys, no other tackles that I would have felt like this is a first round prospect. I could have reached and taken a second round guy in the first, but you know, right. if if Tyler Guyton goes to the to the Vikings, then I am I am scrambling. I'm probably taking chop, right? I'm probably taking a, a pass rusher, and and this is where you end up taking, you know, Peyton Turner, uh, a, a guy a guy the fans would be like, who, <laughs> you know, um, right. And so, yeah, and, and the, that's the difficulty of drafting in the in the 20s anyway. But the benefit of drafting in the 20s is usually you're in the 20s because you were good. In this case, you're the, drafting in the 20s, but you are in a position where you need these players to be impact players. So that's why I don't think this is going to happen, but hey, we're going to keep going. Second round, Peyton Wilson, the first off the board, linebacker at NC State, goes to the Panthers. Xavier Leggett, wide receiver at South Carolina, goes to the Pats, so that's no longer an option for me. He was my pick at 45. In the last mock, Kamari Lasseter, cornerback out of Georgia, goes to the Cardinals. Kool-Aid McKinstry, you've got a run on corners here, goes to the Commanders. Mike Sanders still goes high again. Uh, Cornerback out of Michigan, top slot corner on the board, probably goes to the Chargers. Troy Franklin to the Titans, wide receiver out of Oregon. Max Melton out of Rutgers, cornerback goes to the Panthers. TJ Tampa, a lot of corners going in the second round. See. Uh, out of Iowa State, goes to the Commanders. Patrick Paul, tackle out of Houston, goes to the Packers. Zach Frazier, center out of West Virginia to the Texans. Chris Braswell, this is a tough one because I probably would have gone with Chris Braswell if he was there at 45. Ed Rusher goes to the Falcons. Kingsley, Samataya, Su- Suamataya. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm sure I said that wrong. Tackle out of BYU. Sounds good to me. Goes to the Raiders and at number 45. Ding. It's a familiar name. It is Braden Fisk. Hey, what do you know? Out <laughs> of Florida State. Yes, we both took the same guy. That's hilarious. At 45. We That's don't communicate on these in advance. It's part of the reason I do that because it's like if we pick the same guy, then it just means we're on the same wavelength. It doesn't mean like we've agreed on it, but we are agreeing on it because I think this would be a great pick. That's why I agreed with the pick when you made it because I think it's the right pick in this situation because I like the idea of saying, hey, 
you know, we we can address both sides of the line right now. We can go get that D tackle, plug him in next to Brian Brzee, and we're set at that position for three, four years. You know, and and when you're not when you're not comfortable with your guys at tackle at defensive tackle, it just you you, you feel weak. You know, you feel like you, when the other team is able to run the ball up the middle against you. You just feel like you have nothing. You have no answer. They're constantly in third and short. It's go to go watch that Rams game. One of the things that happened in that Rams game that made it feel impossible for the Saints to win is uh, oh, what's his name? I always forget the running back's name. Kyron Williams. Yeah, yeah. Kyron Williams was able to get four or five yards on first down constantly. That first Bucks game. One of the reasons it felt impossible for the Saints to win is. Keyshawn Vaughn and the other guy, I forget his name. Uh, they were able to get four or five yards on first down constantly, especially in the first half. And it's so difficult to get off the field when you're going against third and short constantly because you have so many options. Maybe you make a play, maybe they screw up, but the odds are very much in their favor when they're in third and short. It's not in the defensive side. So if I if I can bulk up my defensive tackle, if I can get one of the top D tackle prospects on the board, a guy that fits my my you know typical prototype at defensive tackle. That's what I'm going to get. And that's where it is in Braden Fisk. Were you tempted with Bullard on the board at all? No, not really. I I don't like the idea. Like, like you can get safeties in this draft, but I don't think you need to get it at 45. I, I like Bullard. Someone that could be a slot guy too. Because yeah, they, I mean, they, I think you go after a slot guy. Too. But it is tough. Like, I again, you talk about like, okay, safety. Are you trading right. Marshawn? Where do you, does he translate exactly? Is he going to be a guy that makes an impact? And I feel like I can get an impact safety slot corner later if I need to. Like, look where you drafted CJ, right? So it was a fourth round if anyone <laughs> needed right. that. Right. Um, so I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not drafting for need at safety at 45. I could yeah, trade up. That was definitely the, going through the mock when I was looking at this too with Fisk on the board. And then Bullard kind of got my attention just because of that slot ability. And I was like, eh, but I still, I, I'm with you too. Is like, I just want to address more of the trenches. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I, I like drafting big, big, big guys. Sort of big, want. strong men. Give me the big men. <laughs> give me, the, give me the big boys. <laughs> um, Watch out. That's apparently what Diddy said too. Oh, geez. <laughs> Yikes. All right. Uh, Jordan Morgan, a guy I like to tackle. I would have, you know, if I didn't go with tackle in the first round, Jordan Morgan might be a guy that I take here because I right. think he is a fringe first round prospect and he's just a developmental guy. And people will wince when they see, when they hear that term. But if you're getting him at 45, you can live with that. Uh, at, at, four, at 24, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. At 45, yeah. Um, but I took a, I took, uh, Tyler got in at, at 24 and I'm not, I'm not doing that twice. Um, so no. And then, you know, you can go through, I'm not going to name all these guys. I'm just going to kind of name the big ones at 50. The Eagles get Roman Wilson. I think that's a good pick for them. 51 Steelers get Bo Nix. So there's a pretty big variation in terms of, you know, the Rams took Bo Nix at 20 in your mock. He gets wow, all the way to 50 crazy. in this mock for the Steelers who just keep adding quarterback, 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 quarterback. <laughs> this would give them a room of Russell Wilson, Justin Fields, and Bo Nix. <laughs> um, Ennis Rick Straw to the Rams at 52. Ricky Pearsall to the Eagles. So the Eagles are getting heavy on wide receiver here. Yeah, what's going on? Is uh, some, Somebody want to tell me about uh, that I don't know with them? Yeah, maybe they're they all trade the wide somebody? Quit. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Keon Coleman to the Cowboys at 56. I'd be surprised like if he falls this low. Yeah, I like him. Um, but we'll see. You know, a few other names. No one exciting. This is the problem with doing mocks this far down. Is I don't even need to read you the names. Oh, wow, we got a running gonna, back. Most of you won't know them. Uh, Jermaine Burton goes to the Bucks at 57. Right. You get the first running back <laughs> off the board here. Jonathan Brooks goes to the Lions at 61. I think it will be interesting to see if the Saints are in, in, in play on some of these running backs. Because I do think you have to start planning for post Marshawn Lattimore. I'm sorry, for post Alvin Kamara. And you did that last year with Kendra, but maybe you double up and do it again. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Jonah Ellis. Also, uh, obviously, Jamal Williams just had his 31st birthday. So they, they, they got guys that are up there. Yeah. And I mean, you could, I think you probably draft a guy and have him come in and compete for that RB3 role. But I, I'm still not, I'm not doing that in the second or third round. That seems a little early, but maybe. I mean, yeah, the Saints right. do like drafting running backs in the third round, and if, they, if the guy, if a guy they really like is there, 
We'll see. Um, Jonah Ellis, edge rusher, brother to Caden Ellis, comes off the board at 63 to the 49ers. <laughs> A lot of numbers there. Michael Penix Jr., 66 to the Cardinals. Wow, third round. No way that yeah. happens. I don't know. I mean, at a certain point, the quarter, the teams that need quarterbacks have already drafted a quarterback. <laughs> you know? I, uh, I just think I slipped to the third. I, I still think Penix goes in the first round, honestly. It's maybe, I think, maybe early second. I think it's more likely he goes in the first round than he does in the second round. Because hmm. once guys get out of the first round... It's like every team has passed on them once. Why would you? Why would you take them? And, you know, like if you're tra- drafting a drafting kind of a dart throw quarterback, it's usually because the value is there. And I don't know if the value is there in the second round if you don't believe they're a first rounder. Now yeah, there are good. guys that like J- Jalen Hurts was a second rounder. Uh, Will Levis was a second rounder. So it does happen, but I think it's it's more uncommon than you'd think. Uh, there's to me at least. There's no way in heck I'm taking McCarthy over Penix, but that's me. I don't get it either. I don't. <laughs> I like, uh, but I don't get to make these picks. This right, exactly. The, machine. the machines have decided. <laughs> <laughs> um, Devontae's Walker, wide receiver out of North Carolina, probably the fastest. You know, Xavier Worthy is the fastest objectively, but Devontae's Walker, I would say he was the fastest at the Senior Bowl. Like he's very fast, so he's an interesting guy. Chris Jenkins, defensive tackle out of Michigan, goes to the Jets. Braylon Trice, edge rusher out of Washington, goes to the Falcons. He's another guy I think a lot of people like to the Saints. Devondre Sweat was another guy that I really like at defensive tackle. I'm kind of surprised yeah. to see him this late. If uh, if Braden – or uh, who did I draft? Um, Fisk, yeah. Braden Fisk is off the board, then uh, Tavondre Sweat might be my target if I am still looking at a defensive tackle. But we're getting close here. Remember, I traded for 87. Another running back, Blake Corum, comes off the board. Uh, 77 here. Uh, Javon Baker, UCF wide receiver, goes to the Falcons. Jamari Thrash, fun name, wide receiver, goes to the Bengals. He's out of Louisville. Jalen with that Wright, kind of name, you better be a receiver, right? Yeah. Jalen Wright, halfback out of Tennessee, goes to the Colts. Michael Pratt, wow. pride of Tulane, goes to the Rams in the third round. I think people are, people are trying to sell you on really high value for Michael Pratt. I think this is more where he's going to be. He's going to be that mid-tier guy that goes after Penix, after Knicks, and just kind of in that room. Uh, Wait a minute. Didn't he, Rams go quarterback in round one? No, not in this draft. Okay. Maybe that was mine. Okay. The one that I would argue is I don't think that he goes after Spencer Rattler. I think that Michael Pratt goes before Spencer Rattler. But we'll see. I mean, at this point, it's more about like what – what team falls in love with that guy in interviews and whatever. And, you know, they were both at the senior bowl. So I think the team's got a pretty good look at them there. Um, but we'll see the, the dolphins forfeit a pick here <laughs> That's- right before mine. So <laughs> 86 is not existing. So technically the saints, I traded for the, the 86. Pick. <laughs> so still a little value there. There you go. Um, but who did I go with? You know, the, you're, the guy, the names on the board at this point, a lot of times you're picking guys that, you know, maybe underperformed or maybe you, you didn't see a lot of and they have a lot of potential. I went with Johnny Wilson, wide receiver out of Florida State. This is 87. So I've taken two Florida State guys after getting rid of a Florida State guy. <laughs> uh, in in Jameis Winston, right? Um, and the reason I went with Johnny Wilson is, you know, we've talked previously. I think the Saints do need a big-bodied wide receiver, and that's what he is. I, he was at the Senior Bowl. Check, you know, check, right. he's, the his RAS score is really high. Now, keep in mind, like we talk a lot about the RAS scores, the Saints don't will tell you they don't actually look at RAS as a metric. Like the Saints aren't aren't looking at the guy and be like, I really like him. What's his relative athletic score? But it's it's been proven true time after time after time that the players the Saints like end up scoring very high in the RAS metrics. <laughs> so it's it's a good way to kind of back in of like, I like this prospect. Does he kind of fit the bill of what the Saints look for? And if he does, then you can feel a little more confident about it. So the guy I would compare him to is A.T. Perry, another guy who did have very high RAS metrics. You got him in the sixth round, but 
a, last year we talked a lot about it is because he fell because of character concerns, right? That was kind of ambiguous. We don't really know what they were. We've asked him. He doesn't know what they were. But that's part of the reason he was there in the sixth round. And you look at, so A.T. Perry scored a 9.61. You know, the size is good. The issue for him, I think, was so he's 6'3", 198. So he's big, but... And this, honestly, I, I find it hard to believe that this is accurate, that he's only 6'3", but either way, he, he put up a much much better 40 time than Johnny, but Johnny measured in at 6'6", 231. And he ran a 4'5", 2 in the 40, which is a little slower, but you know, you're looking for that elite size, that AJ Green six, type six, size. 231, that's a big boy. Like, let's, let's look at what AJ Green was coming out. Well, that can't be true. That's a different AJ Green. The Oklahoma State AJ Green. Okay, yeah, this is AJ Green from Georgia. AJ Green coming out, uh, height six three and a half, two eleven. So like by these standards, like Johnny Wilson's size is is incredible, <laughs> and that weight. So he's not going to get bullied. And that, that's the thing with with AT. He's big. He can go up and make plays. But his size kind of allows him to be moved around. Like he's not ever going to be that guy who can really box a guy out. I mean, he could get bigger, but I just like the idea of adding another big bodied guy and they could compete, right? They can go at it and see, you can see who, who fits that bill the best. But um, I just think he, he fits, he, he checks a lot of those boxes. And I still think, like I said, in the last episode, I want to add another veteran guy, maybe a Hunter Renfro or someone like that to kind of help lead this room. But I don't need that guy to be my big guy. Uh, I think this can be that big guy. So I, I kind of like the value here. And again, this is the pick I traded for. So I can, so I'm going to get a little bit more ambitious in terms of, you know, adding a skill position, adding a guy who could make an impact out uh, above the, the investment you're making. And I think that that's what you can get here. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure saints fans will like this as just real quick. I was, you know, looking for some info on them. And this is from a Bleacher Report article, so uh, you can take it uh, any way you want. Uh, but pro comparison, Plaxico Burris. I think fans will take that. Plaxico Burris. Wow, I haven't yeah. heard that name in a while. <laughs> Man, and people forget how good Plaxico Burris was. Um, I mean, and and part of that is because his career basically ended when he shot himself in the leg because he was literally, li- literally <laughs> shot himself in the leg because he was wearing a he had a gun in his sweatpants at a club. And then it ended up being an unregistered gun and he went to jail because of it to, you know, add literally add insult to injury there. But <laughs> like w- he was, he was really good with the Steelers and the giants won a super bowl because of him. Um, so I, I agree. I think, you know, it's like he was a guy who would never blow you away with his athleticism or speed, but was just able to create areas to deliver the ball that no one else could because he didn't even have to really jump. You know, it's kind of like Victor Wembanyama. Like he can dunk from areas that no one else can dunk. Like Plaxico could catch the ball in areas that no one else could get to. AJ Green was the same way because you know AJ Green. I, I thought AJ Green was bigger, but he had like that crazy long wingspan. Right. Um, where he could go get the ball. No, I'm so, seeing no, I, I, I think that this is something that you could do. Is definitely his wingspan too. So you're onto something there. Yeah. No, I mean, I think he's he is that level of elite in terms of. If you can get out of him what he's capable of producing, he could be a star. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. But either way, when I'm trading for a pick, when I'm adding a pick, this is the kind of move I want to make is I want to get aggressive. I want to get a playmaker that I can develop and and maybe be a star in a few years as opposed to making the safe pick, right? Yeah, the only question, too, that uh, I guess a red flag for me, missed four games last year, undisclosed injuries. So I don't, I well, don't yeah, like that's that. the problem with with guys who are long and there's you know, a lot of a lot of exposed parts, right? <laughs> you know, because because one of the reasons it's an issue, especially like tight ends, right? A lot of times tight ends get hurt because the only way to tackle them is to go low, because you can't get them up high. So what happens when you go low? You get knee injuries, you get ankle injuries. Uh, like, why do you have to hip chop tackle Mark Andrews, Logan Wilson? Because <laughs> you can't tackle him any other way. Um, and that's what when, when we when we can kind of bookend this. Like that's one of the reasons guys are complaining about the hip drop tackle being illegal is they're just like, well, if I can't make that tackle, then he scores a touchdown, right? <laughs> so you know, and it's like, yeah, he's gonna get hurt, but I, my job is to stop him from scoring. 
<laughs> you know? Um, and so that's what you end up getting is guys, you know, they go low, they take out your knee, they take out your ankle and then you get hurt. So you got to be careful with those guys. Um, but that's why this is kind of a, this is more like a, a, a lottery ticket than anything else uh, in the third round, which is a good yeah. time to take those. Yeah, I'm interested to delve into some Johnny Wilson film myself, just seeing, like I said, 6'6", 231. That is pretty impressive for a receiver. Oh, no, I saw him at the Senior Bowl, and I, watching <laughs> watching guys try to try to uh, tackle him or, or cover him even, because you're not really tackling at the Senior Bowl. That was, uh, that was funny. Um, but one of the reasons I don't like this mock draft is because pro football PFF focus likes it. really does like it. They gave me an A on both of those picks. Um and uh, but but again, you know, all these grades mean is we have a big board and right. you took that guy lower than we have him ranked on the big board. That's all these grades mean. There's really no analysis behind that. That's why I got Braden. I got Tyler Gay in and number 20 at 30. So it was a B. I got the Braden Fisk. Uh, they had him at 38. I took him at 45. I get an A. Johnny Wilson. They had him at 79. I got him at 87. I get an A. That's right. All exactly. That that's all that means. So uh, I think their big board is usually wrong. <laughs> so I don't get super excited. But it is always nice. Anytime you get an A, you'll be like, well, thanks. I feel like I'm pretty swell too. Right, little pat yourself on the back. Yeah. Feeling good about it. Like I said, it's like, I got to show Mickey my trade. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey, what do you think? <laughs> He'd be like, yeah, get away from me. <laughs> Like what is what is the internet? Uh, I don't think Mickey's a big computer guy. But hey, I think that's it. I think that's all I got. Anything else you wanna you wanna hit before we get out of here? No, we are just three weeks away from the real deal, so uh, cannot wait to uh, get the event over with. It's uh you know the, the whole build up for it, and then man oh man, once we get to draft time, that is some long three days for all of us. I had a friend, and this is just an aside. I had a friend who was like. He, he was like, he has, he, he did a documentary and he's got all these all, like, all access passes to these festivals. And he's trying to get people to go with him. Wow. And he was like, oh, there's the, this one in uh, Dallas in April. Do you want to go? And I was like, oh, yeah, da- yeah, I could probably take a couple days in April. What are the dates? And he was like, April 25th through 27th. <laughs> and I was like, I don't need to look. He was like, if you can get a cheap flight, maybe, you know, like, uh, <laughs> it's not about the flight. <laughs> it's literally the exact days of the draft. Right. And he was just like, damn, you're, yeah, my bad. <laughs> That's always, um, every year for me, I'm always like with the with the draft, uh, begging that the Jazz Fest doesn't have the acts I want to see in the first weekend. It always coincides. Jazz Fest? Jazz Fest and uh, the first week of the NFL draft. Is that the same? Yep. Oh, I didn't realize that. Jazz Fest, man. Jazz Fest. I thought Jazz Fest was in June. No, it's coming up. And then, yeah, the second weekend, you get to kind of kick back and relax and enjoy after going through the madness of the first week of the draft, at least. Jazz Fest 2024. What are the dates? I want to see Foo. April 25th through May 5th. You're right. So it is the exact same, exact same dates. Right. So that's yeah. why it's like, yes, yeah, so and so is coming to Jazz Fest. And then all of a sudden, you know, when they, they announce what days they're playing, you're like, you got to be kidding me. They're, they're coming during the first week of the draft. There's no way I can make it. That happened to me one year with Tom Petty. Luckily, he ended up coming back and I did see him before he died. <laughs> Good. Yeah, Happy I mean, I, he was on my list. I was like, I love Tom Petty, so I was like, I need to see him. Are we getting the Rolling Stones this year finally after like the seventh year of trying? Supposedly, but I think th- the tickets are like three hundred bucks, I believe. And he's like eighty-seven years old, so I could, you know, a stiff breeze goes through, and he might not make it. Yeah, I'll pass on that one. But I'm looking forward. I'm going to take my fourteen-year-old to see the Foo Fighters. I want to see the Killers. I know the Killers are here. Oh yeah, I think their first weekend though. I believe maybe not though. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that now. Like, I am of the age where dad rock is like the bands I grew up with. Right. Uh, I uh, I was when I when I went to I went home recently, obviously, and we ended up at a at a speakeasy, a speakeasy, right? Which is just it wasn't it didn't have a password or anything, but it was like they didn't advertise. It had like a a barber shop sign at the at the like it was just a did they have a door with a sliding window. Well, I mean, in, in the sense of that, it wasn't like didn't have a password or anything, but it wasn't you would I would have never known it was a bar. I would have assumed it was a barber shop. But like my cousin goes to college in that area. So she was like, oh, it's so cool. It's going. They right. were playing. I kid you not. Like all of these like 22 to 25 year old children were sitting there 
with the the playlist was like like 2000s like alternative like they were playing like Nickelback and Blink 182 and uh, like some 41 um you know I, I was waiting the whole time for Creed it didn't have, I bet if I waited long enough I would have got some Creed but like it was so weird cuz I knew every word to every one of these songs and you would look around and you would see like these children bag. and be like who what the fuck is this? <laughs> what and I was like you don't know this song anyway uh we didn't stay very long because I was not the demographic that was that frequents that establishment um in terms of like i'm like 12 years older than the oldest person in there but hey, at least it, they had good music but it, no well that's the thing they were playing it ironically well it was like a, a throwback night or something no, well, well, like, like they were not playing it because everyone there was like jamming out to Blink One Eighty Two the way you would if you went to like a bar in New Orleans with a bunch of like thirty year old people. You know, they were all just like, <laughs> "My dad used to listen to this." Oh, so it was more of like an insulting jest. <laughs> no, I mean they were having a good time. The bartenders were our age. <laughs> I think the bartenders were having fun. <laughs> right, there it you just, go. But it was very much like an ironic. It was just very, it made me feel very old that like the music I grew up with is now being listened to by, by zoomers, ironically. Um, no, I hear you. Like, you know, what you tune in into like Bayou and you hear like classic rock. And when it starts to become music from your time, you're like, wait a minute. Right. It's like, if I walk into a bar and they're playing foreigner and I'm like, Oh, it's my mom's favorite. Man. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway. All right. Wait, this, this, we got off, got off the, off the map here. Uh, but thanks everyone for listening. Another mock draft in the books, the most wrong of them all. We've done it. Um, we'll be coming back next week. We'll have some more topics. I do want to do one episode on like breakout candidates. So I think that's, I think that's what we can do. Maybe the first episode next week, assuming nothing crazy happens. We can come up with a list of breakout candidates for this season who might have a big season, that sort of thing. But, uh, if you have any ideas, anything you want to hear, hit me up at Jeff. No, I can hit up Steve at Steve Geller. WWL and uh, you can hit the show at saints underscore pod check out WWL.com you can listen to Steve on sports talk uh, every day uh, as long as he's he's doing that sort of thing I'll be on there eventually um, you'll be back <laughs> one, of, one of these weeks I'll be back um, but all right thanks everyone for listening another one in the books who dat go saints getting ready for that draft see you soon who dat nation one of these weeks, you're going to just say peace out, Seacrest, like I want you to. Peace out, Seacrest. There we go. We got it. All right. <laughs> Bye.